good, good afternoon. My role today is uh, just to bring the room to order, which has happened, uh, and to welcome all of you on behalf of the host of this uh, amazing event, the Graduate Institute. I would just add two little things. One is how happy we are to co-organize this event again with the Belgian mission to the WTO. Some of you may remember last year we had a fantastic event bringing together the DG of the WTO and the ILO. And this year's event um, looks as impressive. So thank you so much to the Belgian mission for uh, the cooperation. The second little point I would add goes to the topic of, of this year's event. Uh, to be honest, early on we thought of calling it in defense of multilateralism or something like this. But we've had lots of speakers already last year speaking in defense of it, but we thought let's face reality and openly discuss the other things out there. Plurilateralism, regionalism, and let's be honest, unilateralism. So the task today is to debate the division of labor between these different levels and find a balance between getting things done on the one hand and having a, an open and inclusive multilateral system. Excited to have all of you here. Wednesday afternoon, 2 o'clock, a full audience. It's, uh, it's really impressive. Uh, I turn now to Ambassador Geert Meule for a few words of introduction. <clears throat> Thank you, Joost. Uh, dear Minister Reinders, uh, dear Deputy Secretary General Durand, who from UNTAD, who is uh, falling in from, for Secretary General Kitui, who gave me a call yesterday saying that he's stuck in Kampala, and so we understand that fully. Dear Executive Director Gonzalez from ITC, dear colleagues Ambassadors, Zhang from China, uh, Wilson from the United States, uh, Mark van Eukelen from the EU, and Lauro from Benin, dear Professors Hoekman, Polin, and Lo. Let me thank all of you for having accepted our invitation to take part in this debate. Dear colleagues, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, DG Azevedo will join us a bit later. Um, let me now like to thank you as well, the audience, uh, for your overwhelming presence here today. It shows that the subject that we are discussing today uh, is of utmost importance. And allow me, before giving the floor to the moderator, maybe to say a few words about the title of our panel. Uh, by choosing the title, Plurilaterals, the new way forward in global trade, we wanted to be a bit provocative. We wanted to stimulate the debate to grab attention because very bluntly put, uh, it is the preferred option of my country to keep the multilateral trading system and to not replace the MTS by some kind of a PTS or plurilateral trading system. The reasons are very straightforward. I will just quote two of them. The first one is that my country is one of the most open economies in the world, and so it is just a matter of uh, good understood interests. The second reason is that my country is a staunch supporter, ever been uh, since the Second World War, of multilateralism. We do believe that multilateralism is the best guarantee for a peaceful and, yes, also inclusive development on a global scale. And so this is why we organize this panel debate. We do hope that it can contribute to the current thinking and maybe even to some decision making on the way forward in global trade. So without further ado, I will give the floor now to Dr. Patrick Law, who is going to lead us through our discussions this, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon. My first task is to introduce the keynote speaker but I rather suspect he does not need much introduction. Most of us will have known him, or many of us will have known him for many years. He spent a good part of, two, the best part of two, to get, two decades and some in various uh, functions at the World Bank. He's now a professor of economics at the 
European University Institute, and he's been very active in policy circles for years. He has a massive publication record, and I'm going to now welcome him to start us off in on this very interesting topic. Bernard. Thanks for um, the introduction, and I th also thank you for inviting me to speak on this topic. I am Dutch, and I think we are probably even a little bit more open than Belgium is. And <laughs> I am also a committed multilateralist, so I think one of the, we're, we're not going to get too far away from the topic that was discussed here uh, last year. That said, I think everybody in this room knows that the multilateral trading system is not exactly in very good shape, right? It is in trouble, and it is in trouble in three dimensions. Uh, what gets a lot of attention and what has been getting a lot of attention uh, in the last few years is the negotiating function of the WTO, which has been essentially comatose for quite a few years now, right? That's the Doha Development Agenda. And again, we're not going to spend a lot of time here today, or at least I'm not going to spend a lot of time rehashing why that didn't go anywhere. But I think it's important to reflect a little bit on that because in, in trade policy circles, there has been kind of this debate that has been ongoing, sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly, that says essentially the, the, the negotiating process is like a bicycle, right? And if the bicycle isn't moving, then the system gets in trouble. And the moving is very much through negotiations. Other negotiations haven't been going anywhere fast. So one of the kind of stylized facts has been for quite a while that the system really wasn't in that serious trouble, right? And the reason this debate has been going on in the literature among observers of the WTO is it's always been held that this is actually quite a robust system. It works well. It's not just about negotiations. There are other dimensions of the organization that are important, and in particular, the dispute settlement system has always been regarded as the crown jewel of the WTO, and people would point to that and say, see, things are not as bad as you say. We might not be getting anywhere in negotiations, but we have the system. I think that is now very much open to question, right? So we have the process of appellate body budget uh, judges not being appointed, new ones, and I think also very importantly, the deliberation function of the WTO is stuck. Um, the stakes, I think, are very high. I think there's an excess of complacency, uh, certainly, I would argue, in this city, in terms of where we are, in terms of what might happen, what the downside risks are. So I think it's really critical from the perspective of safeguarding what has been built up since the Second World War in terms of multilateral trade cooperation that we take this seriously. Now, why are we where we are uh, in terms of uh, the current situation? I would argue one is a lack of trust. Uh, there is a lack of trust among the members of the WTO, and that's kind of related to, I think, a lack of a sense of what is the common purpose, right? What is the purpose of the WTO? What are, you, what are we trying to do with this system? And I think those two dimensions are reflected in what I would call the misuse of consensus and the misuse of special and differential treatment. And these two things are related. Um, clearly, consensus is an important part of how the WTO works, but increasingly the notion that things have to be done by consensus is being used to actually block discussion of issues. It's being blocked to put things on the agenda. It's really being used for purposes which I think really undercut the, the reason we have a WTO, the reason we have all the committees and councils, which is to actually talk to each other to deliberate on issues, both issues which have already been agreed, but as, if not more important, issues on which there are no rules and which a number of countries believe we should have start thinking about what actually makes sense to do. So I think these two operating modalities, if I can call it that, of the WTO, consensus and an insistence on special and differential treatment in the way it's actually pursued in the WTO is actually constraining the ability of members to engage in the type of deliberation that is needed to ensure that the system actually stays relevant to its core stakeholders, right? And whether you define that in terms of business, whether you define that in terms of consumers around the world, essentially if we're not proceeding and actually dealing with current issues, then the relevance of the system gets eroded. and. One consequence of that is, and then we get to the topic of this particular session, 
is of course people are not engaging all that much anymore in Geneva, right? Instead, governments around the world are negotiating preferential trade agreements. And as you well know, that has exploded in terms of the number of these types of agreements. And these are not just your traditional types of trade agreements. These are agreements which actually are dealing with disciplines in areas that go either beyond the WTO or issues that aren't even discussed and addressed in the WTO. So the downside of these preferential trade agreements is that, one, they're discriminatory. So essentially, these are closed clubs. It's very difficult to accede to an agreement once it's been agreed. And secondly, these agreements are not capable of dealing with the big types of policy issues that create negative externalities for other countries. Right? So if we think about subsidies, if we think about <clears throat> state capitalism, if we think about industrial policies, these are not things that get addressed in preferential trade agreements because the governments that are involved in those agreements are worried about free riding or more prevalent is those types of issues don't really arise among the members of these agreements because they are pretty much on the same page already. So they're not really dealing with the big sources of international negative spillovers. Let me just briefly become a little bit academic here. If we think about what are, why do we have trade cooperation? Why do we have trade agreements? The standard argument is that this is all about dealing with terms of trade externalities, right? So I do something which hurts firms in another country, and we're trying to negotiate disciplines on those rules so that we kind of e eliminate these negative effects. There's another dimension of why countries cooperate on trade, which has nothing to do with this terms of trade type of dimension, but which really is all about what makes for good policy. Can we collectively figure out what actually makes sense to do in a particular area which reduces trade costs for firms? and therefore reduces prices for consumers. Right? And quite frequently, these types of issue areas are regulatory in nature. They're not uh, adversarial in a sense. They really require getting around the table and thinking about what actually makes sense for us to do. Now, the type of traditional issue areas that are dealt with um, in the economics literature, which are really all about these terms of trade externalities, require the type of negotiations we've had in the past in the WTO because we have to worry about free riding, and that is something which requires everybody to be at the table. I've already said PTAs don't work in this regard. The trade cost agenda is something where PTAs are actually quite efficient. Right? So governments do get around the table and think about what do we need to do to reduce trade costs by cooperating in particular areas. Right? So partly this is the trade facilitation agenda, but to a large extent this is a regulatory agenda. I would argue, and I think just to get the discussion going, is that the WTO needs to do much more on that trade cost agenda, and that is an area where, one, we can actually pursue a lot more deliberation, and we, we can and should be doing that on the basis of small group interactions. You don't need everybody around the table to discuss these things. A lot of countries have different perceptions and different interests on those types of issue areas, but large numbers of countries potentially could agree on moving forward in a particular area in a way which is not going to harm the countries that are not part of that process. And that, in a sense, is what this plurilateral type of cooperation is really all about. So I would argue the WTO needs to do more on this trade cost agenda, one, because it actually matters economically, and secondly, uh, because it will help provide some oxygen to the system. Right? And I think if we don't generate that oxygen, the institution is in danger of actually withering away. Now, what are necessary conditions to unblock this deliberative function? And what I'm going to say now reflects some of the discussions we've been having in a group that I'm part of, which is being supported by the Bertelsmann Foundation to kind of think through how would you actually make these things work. Um, so just a few points that come out of that work. One is to focus much more on how the WTO actually is working or not working. So to look at what is going on in the various committees. Right? And one of the things that strikes us, the members of this group, is there's very little in the way of evaluative processes in the WTO. Right? If you look at any other international organization, there are systems of evaluation in place. If you look at the OECD, for example, uh, there are systems within the organization to actually encourage learning across the different committees. There's a sense of, are our work programs actually doing what we as governments think they should be doing? 
There is a process of reflection. We don't really have that in the WTO. And there are very innovative committees in the WTO, and there are committees that don't seem to be doing a whole lot. So I think there is quite a bit of scope for learning and assessing why some things are working and others are not. That can also help deal with some of these bigger issues like the dispute about the dispute settlement mechanism. So I think if we're not talking about what those issues actually are, if we're not engaging in deliberation on these types of issues, I think, again, there's a big danger that the system becomes much relevant. Another thing that has been coming out of this group, and that relates directly to the topic we're going to be talking about this afternoon, is plurilateral cooperation and plurilateral engagement. And this is nothing new for the WTO. This is something that was standard practice in the GATT. It continues to be standard practice today, really, in the WTO, where groups of countries get together and say, let's pursue a particular agenda. Let's discuss that. So I think it's not new. I think what it needs to be doing, we need to have much more support for that process. I think the one element that is new is that most of the kind of plurilateral uh, arrangements in the WTO to date have focused on tariffs. Right? So we think about the information technology agreement, Think about zero for zero types of arrangements for particular sectors. What we're talking about now, and what I would argue we need to be focusing much more on, are regulatory policies, non-tariff types of policies, and that would be indeed new for the organization. Would it be problematic to have groups of countries pursuing discussions on the substance of a particular area and potentially even agreeing to rules in this particular area, would that be bad for the system? I would argue not. I would argue that it's actually a good thing for the trading system, both in terms of actually maintaining its relevance, but I think also because the types of issues that are likely to be feasible for that type of cooperation to take place are not going to be issues where we have large negative effects on countries that are not participating. They won't necessarily benefit, but they're not going to lose. So I think that is one of the advantages of thinking about and pursuing and supporting the type of initiatives that have already come out of MC11 uh, by the, the various subgroups that have agreed to start talking about specific issues. One big advantage of this process, of course, is that it doesn't lend itself up to hold up. It doesn't lend itself up to what I would call the abuse of consensus. If you don't want to be part of that discussion, you don't need to be part of that discussion. You don't need to sign anything that comes out of these agreements but you also can't block the countries from moving forward on those types of issue areas. So I think that's an important advantage of the plurilateral process. I've already been talking for too long probably, but let me just come up with a few kind of necessary conditions for this process to move forward and to actually be beneficial. One, it obviously requires leadership, right? It requires countries to actually say, we want to move forward in a particular area. We want to have discussions on this. You need to figure out what other countries would join. I think we've seen that process in the run-up to Buenos Aires and in Buenos Aires. So I don't think there's a big problem there in terms of kind of having that leadership uh, take this forward. I think much more important is we need to have processes in place that this, these types of initiatives don't deal with issues that really don't move the needle. So I think one of the problems with the WTO has been is that business has switched off and there is a perception, nothing of particular importance to me as a CEO or to me as a member of the board of a particular company is going on in Geneva. So I think if we're going to pursue this plurilateral track, we need to deal with issues that actually will move the needle. And I think that is a challenge as to how you identify that. That obviously requires talking to business, to other stakeholders. Uh, I can come up with a list that I think you know, would make a lot of sense, but I think it has to be a bottoms-up process. And I worry a little bit about what we've seen so far in terms of the types of issues that are being put forward, is that there might be a bit too much of the top-down approach in terms of what are these issues, so it's coming from international organizations as opposed to business, for example. So that's, that's, that's a source of worry. A third necessary condition is this has to be completely open and transparent. And I think that means there has to be a very active role for the WTO Secretariat in this process because they are best placed to actually know what is going on, to disseminate information to members who are not necessarily going to be part of these groups. I think here, I think there are lessons to be learned from the TISA experience, the Trade and Services Agreement negotiations, 
where the secretariat was deliberately kept outside of the room, and I think that was a huge mistake. You need to have at least people there who can actually explain to others what is going on. One reason that was done is because TISA was at least supposed to be in part a market access negotiation. I think many of the plurilateral areas are not going to be market access related, so that constraint really disappears. Fourth and finally, I think they have to be inclusive. And I think here, again, there's been a big backlash against trade agreements, partly because those trade agreements tend to be secretive. Uh, you don't really know what is going on. They're black boxes. I think the type of issues that are going to be amenable to plurilateral cooperation don't require secrecy and, in fact, shouldn't be secret because I think you really need to have inputs from the people who are engaged with those types of issues. So that would be a final criteria. Final point. Um, I've been writing with Petros Mavridis, um, who is a lawyer, in terms of both how you would design these plurilateral cooperations, whether you can actually do this in terms of actually appending agreements that get negotiated into your schedules. So I've been an advocate for this for a while in terms of pushing this, this agenda forward, but I would also stress that this is not a panacea. Right? This is not a mechanism which is going to get the US to agree with China on subsidies. So there are a number of these issues there which are very difficult to deal with, which you're never going to get done through a plurilateral process. But I would also argue that if we can collectively go down this plurilateral route, open up discussions, actually start deliberating on new issues, that is also something that is needed to address these big kind of systemic questions which really have to do with leveling the playing field or whoever you would put it. Because there again, there are a lot of allegations going on, but I think the fact is there hasn't been a lot of analytical, deliberative discussion in the WTO as to what actually are the effects of the policies that country A is complaining about with respect to country B. So I think we really need to prepare the ground there. And again, that is something that could potentially be done in a plurilateral context, although obviously we're never going to negotiate agreements on these issues strictly on a plurilateral basis. So let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard, very much. As we would expect, plenty of substance, plenty of food for thought, and a useful contextualization, I think, of what we're going to discuss now. We've got a large panel, so I'm going to appeal to the panelists to be very brief. We'll have a, a couple of rounds of um, questions around topics that I will kind of try to outline, and then a discussion amongst ourselves. And then we really want to leave some time afterwards for uh, questions and answers um, uh, before the Director General comes to close it all off. So I'm going to go with the order that um, the, you, the panel was listed in. That's, that's the easy way out. Um, but before that, let me just say that clearly what we're talking about here is something that had not been entirely anticipated in Buenos Aires. A lot of people will see it as the most significant outcome of Buenos Aires. This idea that there were three ministerial statements signed by 50, 70 plus members in each case that basically appealed for work to be done and to get on with seeking out agendas that are relevant for the WTO and restoring the negotiating function which has been moribund for a decade and a half at least. Now, just to clarify, one, there's a bit of nomenclature confusion sometimes here. I grew up thinking of plurilaterals as fundamentally discriminatory agreements, as is, for example, the civil aircraft agreement and the, um, global, the uh, government procurement agreement to be contrasted with agreements like the Information Technology Agreement, which we have come to describe as uh, critical mass agreements. So for the sake of convenience, can we just for the purposes, I'm not trying to dictate future use of nomenclature, but can we just for convenience think of the, the statements that have been set out, which have clearly emphasized an interest in inclusiveness, 
and a non-discriminatory approach as intended to be critical mass, which means no discrimination. Now, whether or not that's sufficient to make every member happy is something we will get to in the second round of questions. What I'd like to ask the panelists first is how they see this development. Do they see it as, promise, as promising? Do they worry about threats to it? We'll come around in the second round of questions to asking about whether or not this is sufficient for the WTO and whether, in fact, doing this will by in and of itself be enough to get the WTO driving again. So that, that'll be the, the, the second round. For the first round, please just talk about what you see as this seeming, and I emphasize seeming innovation, because it's not really innovation, but it is an, an, an interesting new development which had a certain um, momentum of its own. So with that, let me start by asking um, His Excellency Mr. Didier Reinders, the Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium and the Foreign and Trade Minister, to have a shot. Two to three minutes, if you don't mind, for the first round. Thank you. I will try to be brief. And I'm, uh, I'm a Belgian, but it was quite interesting to listen to uh, the comments from a professor coming from another member state of the Benelux, so it's uh, quite very interesting. And uh, I want just to add that, of course, we are committed to go further with a multilateral approach. That's our first commitment, and since uh, we have repeated that since the Second World War, at least, we are involved in all the multilateral approaches, and we try to, to go further on that. But it's true that we have some blockage for the moment, and so we need to think about other uh, possibilities. And uh, yesterday we had a trade uh, council at the European level with all my colleagues in Sofia, so it was a good occasion to discuss about uh, the evaluation of many discussions uh, in uh, the way of uh, new uh, trade agreements with the Mercosur from the European Union point of view, with Mexico, with Japan, Vietnam and others. Uh, but it was so interesting to discuss about the, the way forward after Buenos Aires. And if you look to um, the multilateral approach, it's maybe possible to have a more flexibility in it. It's not new, it's true, but why not the flexible approach of the multilateralism or a plurilateral approach. And at the open level, we have certain uh, expertise on that. Uh, we have organized a process with enlargement of the European Union. Sometimes it's possible to go out, like uh, UK in the Brexit. Uh, but sometimes it's possible to work with a part of the European Union, with some members. We are not 28, but 19 in the Eurozone. Uh, we are not all in Schengen, we are not all in the NATO, and so on and so forth. And so now we are thinking also at the European level to work with, maybe with a pre-dimensional approach on, on different fields. Why not in the uh, WTO to try to work with uh, all the partners who want to go further in some fields? And so to have the same flexible approach. And of course, but we will speak maybe later on that, with some conditions, I fully agree, uh, with a lot of conditions, and certainly with the role of the WTO, uh, there is a surveillance process needed inside such a, a new uh, evolution. And I mean, uh, it's very important that for the Secretary General there is a real role uh, to follow the different new processes. But I'm sure that it's important, it's maybe a step before to go again further with the multilateral approach, to start with some uh, countries having the capacity to, to move forward. Of course, we need also to take care to all those countries staying out of the process. But again, we have an expertise on that at the European level, and you ask, it's, is, is it possible for some member states to take a leading role in such a process? Why not? And maybe uh, due to our expertise in the European uh, Union, and thanks to Donald Trump, it's maybe possible for the European Union to take uh, a leading role in the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next on the list is uh, Dr. Mukisa Kitui, but he is not here today. And we are honored to have the Deputy Secretary General, uh, Isabel Durant, who is making a very significant contribution to the gender balance of this panel. And I invite you to say a few words. Due, due to the snow in Kampala, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much. Well, um, the ambassador started uh, with the title of this uh, conference saying that it was a little bit provocative. 
Probably uh, it could be provocative here because we are between people convinced that multilateral approach is the best one. But uh, outside of this room, probably plurilateralism is perceived as not only a plan B, but a plan A. Uh, and it's why I think it's important to remind and, and to, to repeat how it's important to, to keep without sacralization, but in any case to keep the multilateral approach as the only good approach. Why? Because, of course, we are uh, more than ever in a global world, uh, in a globali globalized world. It means that only global solutions on only global answers are the good answers. What about migration, climate, etc., etc., and also trade? Of course, it's the only uh, good uh, uh, um, answer. And I think that in the, in the last period, the last decade, probably uh, our countries uh, are not enough adapted to this evolution of globalization. And it's why we are now in, in, in a crisis in trade, as it is a crisis also on other issues and also on European level. If, even if we know that uh, we have to do something on European level, it's not the, easy, the, the easiest period for Euro European Union now because of, not only because of the Brexit, but because of uh, nationalism, etc., etc. So I think that's important to repeat that, to repeat that we need never, we need uh, uh, absolutely common rules uh, share rules on trade, and if you speak about tariff or non-tariff uh, measure, uh, not only on that, do we want to go further with uh, the multiplication of a non-tariff uh, measure? In Jungtat, we have a database with all those uh, uh, non-tariff uh, measures. It's crazy. How could you help, and Madame uh, uh, Aranchan Gonzalez knows that very well also, when you have a new SME, SME starting, how could you prepare this SME, this SME with all the rules that she will uh, 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 um, meet in all the countries when she wants to start with exportation? It's crazy. Do we want more than that? No. I think that more uh, uh, multilateral, plurilateral approach, even more uh, as a plan B, it's not a good solution. And I think that we have to keep in mind uh, this uh, elements. In any case, plurilateralism, in some case, could also reinforce this phenomena because we multiply uh, uh, so some specific approach and so we increase the anti-globalization approach and so sometimes, in some cases, plurilateralism give more plurilateralism. It means that it's probably not a step or, or a trans trans transitional period until we come back to the multilateral approach. It could be also a, a way to kill, definitely, a uh, multilateral approach. In any case, uh, plurilateralism will give, of course, uh, uh, a more fragmented world, what is absolutely not useful uh, in the period uh, where we are. So, for instance, take fisheries. It was an, an issue also in Buenos Aires. How could you explain, tell me how plurilateral approach will help the fish, <laughs> not the fish, but the fisherman. Uh, well, it's uh, it's really not uh, well. Uh, 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 of course, an adapted uh, answer uh, to this question of fisheries subsidies on fisheries, etc. So, uh, uh, of course, I know. Uh, not so uh, for so long period, but I know and I knew it before also in my country and in the European level how difficult it is to 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 develop these paths. Uh, we know that we, I understand that some temptation of uh, alternative solution uh, appear occur. It's normal, but uh, I firmly believe that we could be better of fixing the global machine as developing uh, a smaller or, or designing smaller machines, small ones machines. I think that the, further, the biggest one have to be consolidated and probably without uh, only diplomacy de papa. It was uh, our friend Pascal Lamy, he was here in Geneva last week in the Geneva dialogue that we organized and he spoke about the diplomacy de papa. Uh, I mean the, diploma, the diplomatic way to work uh, countries and with full respect for the, uh, all the ambassadors in the rooms, of course, uh, uh, I'm part of, the, of this game. But probably we have to enlarge the way to negotiate, maybe the diplomacy of Maman, uh, a little bit differently uh, in order to associate all the bodies, all the uh, uh, partners in the discussion. Of course, it will be more complicated, but probably more creative. I think also that we have, of course, we need, as it was said, flexibility. We need also uh, pushing for strong regional agreement. We need uh, regional agreements, of course. Uh, we need also selected sectors where uh, it could be interesting to develop 
temporarily soft or transitional uh, uh, agreement because of the question of the critical mass uh, of those agreements. But in any case, and I finish with that, I think that it's a, a common responsibility of all of us. Uh, we are here with many leaders in the rooms on different levels, which is our responsibility to fight against this uh, new approach, plurilateral approach as the solution. Uh, how we are and how we will, as global leaders, uh, defend the idea that we need, not only to say that in some rooms as here, but to defend this uh, uh, way to work externally as the only way to work in a globalized world. So I think that's, uh, that's the, uh, for me, the, the important to repeat it and to say it more clearly uh, and not only implicitly. Thank you very much. The next um, panelist is uh, His Excellency Dr. Eloy Lauru, Ambassador Permanent Representative of Benin to the UN and to the WTO. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, really, Mr. Patrick Law. Uh, I will speak from my heart. Uh, I represent a constituency, uh, developing countries, uh, least developed countries, and uh, from our assessment, and the practice that we have in negotiating, uh, multilateral trade system is the best uh, approach, the best scheme. Uh, we should continue uh, promoting it, uh, uh, developing synergies and involving different stakeholders. And this event is timely because we have just come from Buenos Aires and uh, we did not get uh, what we, expected, what we expected to obtain in Buenos Aires, there were results, but the scope of these results uh, could not be sufficient. And we would like to continue working with our partners in the negotiation uh, to uh, maintain uh, also our commitment and develop uh, initiatives. Uh, for instance, uh, we have agricultural issues, uh, particularly uh, domestic support uh, pillar. Uh, in Buenos Aires, we could not reach agreement on this. Uh, we could not also reach uh, agreement on uh, fisheries subsidies uh, as we expected this before uh, going to Buenos Aires. We should maintain our effort, uh, continue uh, promoting uh, these objectives so that Nobody will be left behind. That is the goal of the SDGs. And we, I will also men mention the issue of cotton. That is v vital for us because in our agricultural uh, sectors and in our economies, cotton is a vital sector. Uh, Madame Arancha used to visit our countries and regions and she knows very well uh, that this sector is vital for us. Uh, I will also mention the issue of SDTs, sustainable, uh, special and differentiated treatment, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the target that we have as developing countries and least developed countries to inject developing dimension in the rules uh, and in the practices of uh, trade system. Uh, that is why uh, plurilateral, we could not uh, go align ourselves uh, absolutely on, on this, but trying to promote, to continue promoting a multilateral trading system while knowing that uh, to some circumstances and in some cases, uh, some countries uh, prefer plurilaterals. But uh, as we saw it uh, historically, Plurilaterals uh, could not continue uh, to be observed. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Mr. Hockman mentioned the issue of civil aircraft agreement. We have the issue of uh, uh, dairy product, product and also the issue of uh, meat, bovine meat. All these agreements, uh, they could not continue as uh, they should uh, be. Uh, promoted and uh, uh, some of them terminated uh, historically and they have been inserted in uh, agricultural negotiation and uh, issues uh, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary uh, 
discussions. So uh, to sum up, we prefer multilateral trading system and we, we should continue working and promoting this while not excluding and preventing some uh, who are advanced to go for plurilateral. Uh, the system is uh, a consensus-based and rule-based system which will keep within this framework. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, His Excellency Mr. Mark Van Hoekelen is the Ambassador and Permanent Representative for the EU at the WTO. And Patrick, many thanks and also thanks to Ben for the very useful introduction. I have two minutes and I'm going to make five points. You're going to do what? Uh, first, um, you know, the political situation we're currently in in WTO should give rise to the following maxim. maxim. No one can impose anything on anyone, but at the same time, no one should stop members from discussing matters and starting negotiations on a less than multilateral basis. That should be the political precept on which we work given the current stalemate. As uh, Deputy Prime Minister Reinder said, I mean, in the European Union, we're pretty comfortable with this notion of a subset of members moving forward. In the European Union, we typically call that variable geometry. Um, we prefer to call this in the WTO context, flexible multilateralism. Second point, uh, plurilaterals may be seen as a new way forward, but they are by no means new. Those of you who have some notion of the history of the Tokyo round, which ran from 73 to 79 now, many of you were not even born, um, but look at what happened during the negotiations of the Tokyo round, you then had the voluntary codes. The voluntary codes on things that later on became multilateral. Subsidies, anti-dumping, countervailing measures, TBT, all were voluntary Tokyo codes, which were then multilateralized through the Uruguay round. So this is nothing new. It is a way forward that has been tried and tested. Three, as Patrick was saying, uh, semantics are a very important enemy in the debate. We need to know what we're talking about. What we have in mind in the European Union is what Patrick called critical mass agreements, not exclusive plurilaterals like GPA or like aviation but more like ITA or the one that hasn't delivered yet, EGA, but it could be on many other subjects. Uh, of course, what then is important is critical mass. This can only fly when you have a critical mass, and a critical mass is not only about numbers of members, it is about economic weight of members. Fourth point. Um, for such a plurilateral system to work, the rules that will be agreed upon in this context have to be enforceable through the dispute settlement system of the WTO. They have to be enforceable, and we have to make sure that the rules we agree to are interpreted and applied in a way that do not lead to a deviation with the multilateral rules of the WTO. Therefore, it's important that they are embedded in the dispute settlement system. Finally, uh, would this be applicable to any subject? No, no. Fishery subsidies, agricultural subsidies, clearly these are multilateral subjects, and we have to keep on working on that track. There are plenty of subjects that lend themselves to this notion of variable geometry. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. It now, it's now uh, for his Excellency Ambassador Sh Xiang Shen Zhang. Is that more or less? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Ambassador <laughs> of Diplomatic of China for WTO. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, first of all, I would like to make it clear that uh, I'm a fundamentalist of multilateralism. Having said that, uh, I have no objection 
to like-minded like members discussion on new issues and certain conditions. Uh, Bernard uh, has just uh, elaborated those conditions. We have the common responsibility to maintain the strength and the functioning of the multilateral trading system. Only when the multilateral trading system is strong and robust, well, the proliferatory approach play positive and a supplementary role. With regard to the new issues that the business community are concerning, for example, e-commerce and investment facilitation, of course, WTO should discuss. Otherwise, this organization will be losing its relevance. In cases when some members are not ready, while well, some members are ready, of course, later will start, can start first. It's to lead by example and say, look, that's what we want to do. Do you want to have another thought? So for the like-minded members, they should not exert pressure on other members who are not ready to participate. Rather, there is a readiness to welcome others to participate at any time without any condition. And welcoming them and waiting for them to say, OK, let's study the multilateral discussion in the WTO. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's now uh, um, Arantxa, Arantxa Gonzalez, Executive Secretary of ITC, former WTO. Thank for you, Patrick. Former formidable boss. Go ahead. It's very cold outside, and you've been promised a hot debate. So let me be a bit provocative. First, I will start uh, with uh, what uh, we've already heard. This is plurilaterals are not a new feature of the WTO. The question today is, what is it that these plurilaterals are meant to fix? So what's the problem to which plurilaterals is the answer? I think it's fair to ask that question. So let me take two steps back. If I go over the two minutes, you discount this from my second round, Patrick. <laughs> Get to the second round. So, two steps back. WTO is about first, and this is something that is written in the WTO book, non-discrimination. Second thing the WTO is about, binding commitments. Not because the others want you to take binding commitments, but because you think this is good for you. Third thing the WTO is about is a supranational system of justice. Sorry, it's supranational, meaning that you agree that someone is going to give you uh, the red card or the uh, blue card uh, when you ask or when you are invited. Four is this contract. It's a contract that is adjustable. It's adjustable on the topics it's adjustable on the members with flexibilities. And it's also adjustable if you don't like the results of this supranational system of justice. You go back and you can redraft this contract. It's your responsibility. And all of this is done on the basis, and it's <laughs> written nowhere, on the basis of consensus. Not to be confused with unanimity, please. You know, I've also been uh, uh, part of... Uh, your world. Uh, and there is a bit of a difference between uh, unanimity and consensus. Consensus is there because what you try to do is create a legitimacy for a system that is a supranational system. So you need an extra layer of, uh, let's say, legitimacy. Now, what's the problem today that we are meant to fix? Let me just enumerate some of what uh, elements that I see as problems. One. Some members are questioning the principle of binding commitments. They say they want to have more space for domestic policies and therefore they don't like to take uh, constraints uh, in the WTO. And let me tell you, if we are to be honest, that this is as much in the South as it is in the North. Second, we are hearing questioning of the supranational system of justice. Some like it uh, when they win, uh, but not when they lose. That's natural. As a football fan, I know that this is 
uh, is bound to happen, but it's a bit of a problem for the system. Some are questioning the, problem, the, the principle of consensus. And finally, some are even uh, thinking that they, are better, they would be better off outside than inside. This is the kind of problem uh, this uh, system has today. And by the way, this is not the only multilateral system that is facing this kind of answers, this kind of uh, questioning. So, can plurilaterals be an answer to uh, this problem? My answer, it can provide a partial answer if. Capital can, capital partial, capital if. So, the rest for the second round. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And now, um, Mr. Chris Wilson, um, Deputy um, Ambassador for the uh, United States. Thanks very much, and um, thanks for including me in the discussion. I, I have a hard time saying no to Belgians, so happy to be here. Um, be before I get to the question, I, I do just want to stipulate that I think we, uh, we do lose sight uh, on this question of the, the brokenness of the negotiating function in the WTO. We, we, we lose sight of the fact that we have some very big and very recent accomplishments. Uh, within the last four years, a new multilateral agreement and the trade facilitation agreement and, a, and an immensely commercially consequential expansion of the information technology agreement, a plurilateral agreement, applied on a most favored nation basis. So we're all preoccupied uh, with having come off of a ministerial conference that was disappointing to many, but I think sometimes that means we lose sight of, of some, some fairly big and, and fairly recent uh, accomplishments that we have in our negotiating work. <coughs> on the question that's been posed, uh, the, the perspective of the United States is one of uh, optimism uh, about the direction that Buenos Aires provided us with in terms of being able to experiment uh, with these processes reflected in the joint statements. This is a welcome initiative uh, from our perspective, but as others have said, it's also our perspective that the utility and the appropriateness of plurilaterals will need to be considered very much on a situational basis uh, and on a substance-driven basis going forward. Uh, plurilateral rulemaking is likely to be much more appropriate and workable in some areas than in others. Fishery subsidies and agriculture have been mentioned, and we certainly agree uh, uh, with, with, with those comments. So the bottom line from our perspective is it depends. That perspective uh, is, is, is reflected in our own approach to the, uh, the principal joint statement initiatives that are now on the table. Uh, the United States is enthusiastically participating in one of them on electronic commerce. On a second, uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises, we're, we're quite interested in the substance of the issue, but I think have some questions about whether a self-standing process is, is strictly necessary to deal with those issues. And with respect to a third, investment facilitation, we're, we're more openly skeptical at this point. So again, there's a spectrum, spectrum in terms of our perspective on the, uh, the processes that are currently on the table. Um, while I think it's our view that uh, these plurilateral initiatives may well hold promise uh, for future negotiations in the WTO, uh, one important point that I would raise here is that these, this, this, this structural uh, process will not, in our view, necessarily overcome some of what we see as some very fundamental obstacles to negotiating su successfully in the WTO. The, the, the mere fact of doing something plurilaterally rather than multilaterally won't necessarily fix some of the problems that need attention at a more fundamental level. And our, our Minister Ambassador Lighthizer has been, has been referring to a couple of these. One, uh, uh, transparency. Even in a plurilateral context, it's going to be extremely important for us to know what's going on. What are the other participants in that process doing? And so here, the issue that we've been raising about the broken nature of our information sharing processes in the WTO, particularly through the notification obligations, 
is just as relevant in a plurilateral context as it is in a multilateral context for us. Uh, same applies to this extremely difficult issue of differentiation. I think it's probably a common view on this panel that we should be promoting the broadest possible participation uh, in any uh, plurilateral initiatives uh, on the part of both developed and developing country members of the WTO. Uh, but that means that we are going to have to grapple with this question of seeing contributions that are commensurate with the ability and influence of each individual participant in these processes. Uh, so again, uh, a point that is as relevant in a plurilateral context as it is multilaterally. Final point, uh, and this, is, this has been raised by others, there are a lot of unanswered questions in this, in, this, uh, in this field on practical and legal questions. What are or should be the limits of MFN application of trade liberalizing rules negotiated plurilaterally? To what extent do we or do we not uh, tie plurilateral disciplines to the dispute settlement mechanisms of the WTO? Very big, complicated, important issues. I think it's our perspective, though, that we don't necessarily need to get ourselves tied totally into knots on some of these questions at this stage and these processes. We'll need to see how the substance begins to evolve, and then hopefully some of these answers will become clearer. Well, thank you very much. Um, a, a certain amount of agreement on the panel, but I wouldn't say it was, uh, there were certainly differences in emphases, and I wouldn't say that there's complete agreement, and maybe we could just explore a little bit more of that. But what we definitely see everyone agreeing with here is that uh, the multilateral trading system is prime, is, it has, has prime, pr primary place, it is important, it's, nothing should do, be done to compromise that. So then we start to get to some of the differences. But before that, clearly, I think everyone would probably agree on this panel that when you talk about um, the, the so-called plurilaterals, I want to say something more about that in a minute, but these so-called plurilaterals, um, whether the, 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 this is a good way to go will depend on a number of things. It'll depend on the topic, it'll depend on atmospherics, it'll depend on whether or not there is a willingness to accommodate interests of every potential party to these agreements because of course one of the things that must be of concern to some of the smaller participants in the WTO is that they won't necessarily be resourced well enough to make sure that what is happening and what is agreed is going to uh, coincide with their interests even if there's nothing discriminatory about it. There may come a day when they would like to be part of it, and it may have been made more difficult by the, way, the direction in which it's, it has gone. That's, that's a possibility. But I think, I think there's, there's, there's one question which doesn't seem to be entirely clear from what everybody has said. When talking about plurilaterals, people have been, some, some, some of the panel have been contrasting them to the multilateral trading system. And I'm wondering whether that actually makes sense in terms of what the intention of these uh, ministerial statements is. The, there is every intent that they should be open to everybody. Does that mean that they are in some way going to be intrinsically discriminatory and exclusive? The answer has to be no. Obviously, caution there that this doesn't occur. But it seems to me that what, what, what a lot of you are referring to as plurilateral is simply a process. It's a process. It's not, you're not making the rules. The rules will have to be agreed by whatever decision-making process the WTO requires, which is consensus. So having these conversations, is this, a th is this in what sense um, would, would this be considered some kind of, of, of threat or some kind of undesirable assault on multilateral, the multilateral trading system? And I'm afraid I would like just to ask, uh, ask you, um, Isabel, about that, because I detected perhaps a sense that in what you said, there was something intrinsically undesirable about going down this road because it would have a de deleterious effect on multilateral trading system. But if we, if we take the, the example of the three um, Jones statement in Buenos Aires about uh, investment facilitation, e-commerce, and uh, MSMEs, 
Of course, it's not nothing. Eh? More than 70 uh, uh, delegation and ministerial uh, ministers signed those declarations. So uh, I don't say that it's not useful to do that. The problem is the two-track uh, process, a track with, well, starting with joint declaration of uh, steps and a second track which, which have to stay the multilateral track. If you speak about e-commerce, for example, I know that very well because Jungtat is really uh, uh, experienced in the supporting of uh, e-readiness assessment on all the countries. How could you discuss on the same uh, level between countries, one with uh, more or less 80% uh, of the population <laughs> buying uh, by, uh, by internet, uh, Amazon and other, and uh, for other countries, only 5% five, five people using this e-commerce strategy as well. Well, it's really difficult to, have to be on the same level in order to discuss on that. So it's why I continue to think that uh, we need absolutely to, to reinforce the negotiators, the information, the training for the negotiators, the capacity to know what it is. When you speak about e-commerce, it's not only uh, uh, having a mobile phone, it's which law you have to have on privacy, uh, which law you have to have uh, on data, uh, how do you organize the, the electronic signature, etc., etc. So it has a lot of things. And to do that, I think that WTO is not alone in the world, especially in Geneva. Other organizations, uh, ILO, UNCTAD, or others, could help in order to build or to try to have a consensus. And probably some consensus which could be really difficult to achieve in the WTO place for some reasons, because sometimes confidence is uh, not enough uh, present or uh, sometimes a bad experience before, uh, some consensus could be built uh, in, another, in other places and with a better coordination and organization between the different organizations in Geneva related to trade, trade in the large sense of the world and not only trade uh, as trade uh, 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 concretely, we could help to prepare or to have some better training, better uh, uh, Accompanying for people, for, for negotiators, for countries, and especially the countries uh, which are not willing to do further. Why do they want to do? To, to, to they, they don't want to go further, but because they are not ready. They, are, they don't have enough information. They are feeling that they will lose and not win. So it was said. So it's why we have also to to work on the reinforcement of all the weak or the, the weak, uh, the, the player with not enough information or capacity to be willing. Because to be willing, ask to, to have enough capacity uh, uh, to, to negotiate with the order in a better position, even if there is no discrimination principle. Of course, we know that there is, on the beginning, uh, some discrimination between the different people. What about the level of information, the level of capacity, the, and the level of willing, depending on the level of capacity and the level of information. But not legally enforced Absolutely. discrimination. Yeah. No, of course. So, so, so there are plenty of flanking move, uh, actions that can be taken, but this doesn't argue that if you don't have everyone on board, you shouldn't do anything at all. I think that sometimes you, 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 do the, you don't have to wait to have everybody on board, otherwise you will never achieve uh, anything, of course. But uh, uh, you have to keep in mind and to, to, to work on two tracks, and the track, the plural, plural, plurilateral track, have to be accompanied directly and in parallel with the other track. Otherwise, you will multiply, uh, as, as it is the case today, and if it is more than today, it will be completely uh, unmanageable. Yeah, that's uh, that's, that's, what, SMEs, we, that's what we want to discuss in the, in the next round. Does anyone else want to add anything to what their fellow panelists have said? Yeah, that's the show. Thank you, uh, Patrick. I tend to uh, agree that uh, proletary is a process. Our objective is to establish multilateral rule. And as uh, my friend Mark just said, uh, and no one can stop uh, like like many members to discuss new issues. Neither the like uh, members, like many members, uh, can force others to join us. For the like-minded members, if we share the objective of multilateral uh, agreement, we need to bear in mind that uh, there are the invisible members who are there with us all the time. And the situation of the uh, members who haven't joined the discussion are different. Some Members are not opposing the issue itself. 
just linking this issue with others. Some members want to maintain their policy space at this moment, and some members are lacking of capacity to participate in the negotiation. So we need to provide a more targeting solution to address those concerns, to encourage them to participate in the discussion. If this process is open-ended, it's inclusive, interactive, I assume that increasingly more and more members will join the discussion. We will get closer and closer to the definition of multilateral. Th that's why you said atmospherics were really important. Yeah. Um, does anyone else want to add anything at this stage? Bernard, any thoughts? Brief ones? <laughs> so I think on the, uh, the MFN issue, right? So I think it's really important that, I think we are probably all on the same page on this, but that the type of issues that we're discussing here that might lend themselves to plurilateral discussions and potentially to plurilateral agreements would be applied on an MFN basis. And I think where a lot of the concerns that people have, including with respect to what might be the implications for countries that don't participate, I think, in my mind, go away. It depends a lot on the issue, so I agree completely on this is conditional, what type of issues we're talking about. But a lot of these issues are going to have to do with domestic policy. So it's really about trying to figure out collectively what actually makes sense in a particular area to do. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's going to agree, right? And you might very well end up with different groups of countries saying we should be going in a particular way. But I think where the value added comes from here and where there is this multilateral dimension is that's never going to happen in the context of preferential trade agreements. Right? So at least here you have potentially an open process to deal with that type of discussion. Now, I think it's an open question, and we can maybe come back to this, is the WTO the place for this, right? And there you could, you know, and I think here my reaction to, to I think also what Isabel said, with respect to capacity, clearly there's going to be differences in capacity, but there's also, and I think that's what the ambassador said, there are countries who instinctively take a mercantilistic approach. So I'm not going to talk about domestic policy unless you give me something, right? You want something, you're always going to try and link things. And I think that's where the plurilaterals come in. It's a response to this linkage strategy which prohibits you from moving forward in these areas. So I think, again, I would emphasize that a lot of these issues that potentially could lend themselves to critical mass type of cooperation are areas where you don't need linkage and where it doesn't give you any leverage at all because what you're doing is something that is actually good for you and we're trying to figure out what makes for good policy. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the reason why we prefer uh, multilateralism is that uh, uh, with uh, plurilaterals, uh, we could not be in our comfort as developing countries and least developed countries. Uh, with uh, MTS, we can secure uh, flexibility, uh, policy space, and this is important. We know that uh, critical mass is something that is uh, uh, pivotal in plurilateralism. But uh, when we developing countries, least developed countries, SVs, we are pushing for having results uh, in MTS. Uh, that is because uh, immediately uh, we could not be uh, at our ease uh, in plurilateralism. So uh, we will uh, uh, urge the others uh, that they uh, work with us, and uh, they recommit themselves so that we could uh, harvest results in the areas that they think that they could promote within plurilaterals. Let us try and uh, look at the scopes of these issues uh, and develop synergies, uh, be confident that uh, while working together in the different uh, uh, constituencies and uh, in the different uh, groupings, we can uh, uh, have results. Uh, and what happened in, Bu in Buenos Aires showed that uh, once back to Geneva, we should uh, work together and uh, have agenda to have this result in the different areas. Thank you. No, just, just some words to say, of course, we are committed to, uh, to go to a multilateral approach, so there's no doubts about that. We are on the same line. That, but 
Uh, and we are also committed to help the less developed countries to take part in the process because we are financing a lot of training, a lot of uh, help coming from the European Union to many countries to do that. So there's no doubt. And we try also to have an inclusive approach at the multilateral level. Uh, last year, it was said, we have organized here a meeting with the two DGs of ILO and WTO. If it's possible to have an inclusive approach on trade with uh, social issues, environmental issues, human rights issues, it's perfect. But if you have a lack of progress, at the multilateral level, also if you have some difficulties with the uh, dispute settlement system for the moment. Uh, of course, at the European level, at least, we are thinking more and more about uh, bilateral agreements. And we will have a huge network of bilateral agreements everywhere in the world. And we are working on the regulations. So on the tariffs, it's difficult to understand, but it's not too difficult. It's possible to have a, a real presentation on the different tariffs. But the regulation is more difficult. So we try to work on a real regulation cooperation. And in between, between those uh, uh, very difficult network of bilateral agreements and a multilateral approach, is it not needed to let some member states of the WTO going further? I said some, but I fully ag agree that we need to have a critical mass. It's impossible to say with some we will do something. That's a bilateral agreement, no more than that. But is it possible to have a critical mass? Is it possible to be transparent? Is it possible to be open to all the others, to all the member states? And is it also possible to take some measures to protect the non-participants? That must be possible. But like we have seen in other institutions, it's quite difficult to let some member states organizing a blockage in some fields. And so it's maybe a step to go further. I don't know if it's possible for others to join later. But I'm sure that in between, so between the network of bilateral agreements and a real multilateral approach, it's maybe possible to do something with uh, like-minded uh, countries, but again, with a critical mass. Uh, and, and that's a real issue, because uh, we have seen that it's not so easy to put inside the trade policy some other elements social issues, and environmental issues, and uh, maybe also some human rights issues. And we try to do that from the open point of view, but at the multilateral level, it's something difficult. So in between, why not a plurilateral, or I prefer maybe to say a flexible multilateral approach. Okay, so unless somebody else wants to say anything, I think we should move on to the second round, because time is, time is moving along. Um, I just want to, so, so here we, we've really started on this conversation already talking about what else is necessary, what else should the WTO be doing, um, maybe also what the WTO shouldn't be doing. Um, and is it necessary that there is a range of other activities that the WTO has either been involved in the past or hasn't even thought of, which are necessary to sustain a situation which is made sufficiently flexible by an approach that allows a group of, uh, of, in, of, of, of members to explore, investigate, consider, debate, and, and make sure that that whole process is, is transparent and is open. Is that, is that a, a possibility? I just want to, you know, when I was in the Secretariat, we, always used to, we, weren't, we didn't have opinions, we didn't have views, we certainly didn't contradict ambassadors. So I just want to take this opportunity to say, mildly contradict Mark on something he said, because it does, it does concern me a little bit that if, if I was a developing country and I was worried about my capacity to participate in these agreements, I would not want to see the, what happened in the Tokyo Run Code situation repeat itself. Because effectively, if I, if I was Malawi, and apologies if I've chosen badly, if I was Malawi, and suddenly I was told, if, if you don't sign on to the, to the WTO lock, stock and barrel and adopt all the agreements which you didn't have to adopt before, you can't be a member of the GATT. So overnight, Malawi suddenly finds itself party to a whole lot of agreements, some of which I would make strenuous economic arguments in, 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 in the direction of saying they shouldn't be party to these agreements because they're not ready for them. Um, so, the multilateralization needs to be a voluntary process, and I think that was not what happened with the with the with the um, with the Uruguay round. And I think that was a, a, a historical mistake on the part of the multilateral trading system. Uh, some of the consequences of which we're still trying to work through. Uh, 
So I know I'm, I'm not a panelist, and I'm probably overstepping the mark. But I do think, I do think that um, we need to give serious consideration to issues that have been alluded to already in relation to what else do we need. So this time, let's just go straight across the, the, the starting with Ambassador Larue. Thank you, really. Uh, I think that uh, uh, to uh, continue uh, the effort uh, and our work, uh, we should uh, uh, try to understand uh, what uh, developing countries uh, submit as a request, taking into account their capacity, the level of development, because uh, we are in a system that comprises different groupings of countries and different levels of countries. You rightly mentioned the case of Malawi. Uh, if we take uh, Benin, Bangladesh, uh, Haiti, and other countries, we uh, can assess the situation in terms of uh, uh, how, to which extent they can utilize uh, the WTO rules and also uh, the level of capacity in terms of infrastructure, uh, in terms of uh, institutional uh, capability and uh, uh, human resources. Uh, for instance, uh, and uh, Madame Duran uh, rightly uh, commented on the issue of uh, a digital divide. Uh, in these countries, developing, least developed, uh, and uh, uh, as this, uh, this remains a very important constraint. Uh, many people do not have access to energy. How can they uh, be connected to internet? How can they use uh, e-commerce tools? Uh, the issue of training also. We know that this presents uh, a lot of potential, but we have to work hard uh, to develop capacities. And there are, uh, within the WTO system and uh, the MTS, some tools like Enhanced EF and Aid for Trade, and through bilateral, regional, and in intergovernmental cooperation, we could also promote this effort. And we thank our partners that have been supporting us uh, in these areas. We should continue uh, working together, cooperating uh, to promote and develop capacities, and also the issue of uh, special and differentiated treatment. Uh, we requested these uh, flexibilities uh, when we are preparing Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. even before Buenos Aires in Nairobi in December 2015, we could not get answers, re results in this area, and this is not good. We should, uh, once back to Geneva, uh, recommit ourselves and work to harvest results in these areas. And these are all these put together that could help us and uh, build confidence to continue our, our effort. And I say that for plurilaterals, we could not prevent uh, countries from uh, following this path, but for us, uh, it's not uh, easy to follow this path. We will be more uh, in our comfort in the multilateral uh, trading system. Right. That are some ideas I wanted to submit uh, before we continue our conversation. Thanks. Thanks. Mark. Thank you, Patrick. Um, First of all, on, on Tokyo and, 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 and WTO. Um, I was not saying that necessarily a, a plurilateral has to be folded into the multilateral and definitely not by force. The creation of WTO in 1994-1996 was a unique situation. We're not going to recreate the WTO. At that time, every country was asked, if you want to become a member of WTO, all right, but you sign up, you sign up, lock, stock, and barrel. All agreements. We're not there anymore. So 
if there is a plurilateral, no one will later on force it down people's throat. It won't happen. Perhaps it happened in 1994, but that's not the world of 2018. <coughs> now, what should happen in addition to variable geometry? I think there are three things that we should uh, pay a lot of attention to. The first, Chris has already mentioned, transparency. We just don't know enough. We don't know enough of what is happening in reality with regard to trade measures in the world. There is a very patchy record, and that has to be improved. I think a, an organization that respects itself should know what is happening. Two, we have already discussed it, Eloi has mentioned to it, the very difficult subject of trade and development. The question of how to differentiate between countries with regard to trade disciplines. The GATT, the WTO, has been struggling with this actually since 1964 when UNCTAD was created. We have been trying various methods but the results have been very mixed. And I think we have to have another go at it because otherwise, even things that we have been asked to do by 2020, called the fishery subsidies file, will again be very hard. We need to get an operational fair handle on the question of differentiation. Finally, we have to watch out for overreach. Often, as an ambassador, when I am the, in the WTO, I ask myself, but what has that got to do with the WTO? Things like, and I apologize beforehand, the digital divide, very, very important subject, extremely important subject. But the WTO will never, ever be able to bridge the digital divide in and of itself. So if you say that the WTO has to deliver that, of course we're going to fail. Of course we're going to fail. Take access to energy, extremely important. But the WTO does not have anything in its rule book to deal with that matter. So let us not set us up for failure. Don't ask things from the WTO that it is inherently incapable of delivering. Why should we go for disappointment? It's already hard enough. I'm going to disagree with, uh, with Mark, if I may. Um, I think one of the problems the WTO has is to pretend that it lives in clinical isolation. And the WTO does not live in clinical isolation, which doesn't mean that the WTO has to resolve all the problems in the world. It doesn't have to. But the WTO today lacks a space where the interface between trade rules and disciplines will be discussed with the intersection between those rules and disciplines and other areas of international life. It's called the deliberative space of the WTO. It exists formally for relations with the bank and the fund. It's called the coherence agenda. But the world doesn't stop at macroeconomic issues. There is no way today you can talk about trade and not talk about climate change. There's no way you can talk about trade and not uh, think in broader environmental terms or in broader inclusiveness issues or about energy or about, and the list goes on. Now, it does not mean that the WTO will have to do rules on all these issues. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to, not even on that. Certainly not the ITC. No. But it needs to take into account that all these things exist and they are part of an ecosystem. And this is why, uh, frankly, to be quite honest with you, uh, we decided to sponsor this declaration on women and trade uh, for the Buenos Aires Ministerial Declaration. Not because the WTO is going to create special rules uh, for women's economic empowerment, but if I look at the figures, only one in five exporting companies are women-owned. Despite the fact that women-owned businesses represent 50% of businesses in any country. So the fair question is to say, what is wrong? Now, again, we have, you have, to amplify the space for dialogue over intersection between WTO and other areas. You did it with labor. Great. 
but there are many other areas. And until and unless you do that, it's going, it's going to be very difficult to create rules on uh, electronic commerce, for example. Now, to electronic commerce. I think we haven't spoken, uh, in, uh, uh, in my view, in honest terms here. The choice today in electronic commerce is not between plurilateral or multilateral. The choice is between plurilaterals outside the WTO in mega regionals or plurilaterals within the WTO. So go and read the TPP, Trans-Pacific. It's been rebaptized now. I don't know, uh, David, maybe you, you tell me the right name. But there are, OK. In this agreement, there is 36 pages on electronic commerce, on issues ranging from electronic signatures to consumer protection, data flows, and the rest. So here is a standard. That will become the standard, absent uh, this being discussed and appropriated by the rest of the WTO membership. Now, this is the product, uh, in my view, of uh, uh, I don't discuss this if you don't discuss this. And it is fair to discuss electronic commerce. It is also fair to discuss agricultural subsidies. It is also fair to discuss cotton subsidies. It is also fair to discuss services. And the list goes on. Sorry. No, just, just to say further, I fully agree that we need to discuss on all those issues inside the WTO and not just with bilateral agreements on trade. Uh, the second element, of course, we are very open to, to see how it's possible to have a better collaboration, to have an inclusive policy with other organizations. So I will come back. We have organized last year a meeting with ILO. Maybe it's possible to do the job with other organizations in, in the future and other partners. But uh, I, I want to go back to your question about was it possible and what do you... What do we, do we need to do? First, not to repeat again, but transparency, it's also at all the levels. Not only for the discussions inside the WTO, multilateral or plurilateral, but also in the bilateral negotiations. At the open level, it was very strange. We have uh, asked, with the Commission, with the support of the Commission in some member states, to organize the transparency. It was refused during many years by some other member states. And so if we want to uh, uh, go further with the real transparency, it's first a question to the member states to, uh, to be uh, able to, to manage that. And it's very important because uh, uh, it's also very important to, to try to have the support of a uh, very large segment of the population about uh, the, the trade uh, policy. The second element is the surveillance. I've said that briefly in my first intervention, but if we have a multilateral approach, maybe some plurilateral approach, and also a lot of uh, bilateral agreements, it's important that the WTO has a capacity to organize a certain level of surveillance about the processes, to be sure that it's in line with the rules, and to be sure that it's possible to consider that as some steps to a multilateral approach at the end, and not just in different ways or on the different part of the, uh, of the world. Uh, and then uh, I want also to say that uh, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to, uh, uh, to understand why it's so uh, in contradiction now, uh, 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 where there are so many contradictions now about uh, the um, dispute settlement uh, system, because it's a key element of the WTO. If you agree on some rules, you need to have a place uh, to uh, discuss about your, your disputes. And there it's maybe time to have a sort of creativity about that because all oh, we are staying with the actual situation and we will have in some times a real difficulty on that. Or it's maybe time to think about some form of arbitration or other kind of uh, solutions <laughs> to stay in a system where it's possible to have an agreement, to have some rules and then to apply the rules and if there's a conflict to go to a, a dispute settlement system. And for the moment, we are afraid about the actual situation. If we have a blockage and we are just staying on such a blockage, uh, it will be uh, very difficult to, to go further. So I'm sure so that the third element after transparency as a real uh, surveillance role for the WTO is to think about new form of dispute uh, settlement if it's impossible to go back to the uh, actual mechanism. Well, uh, to, to add in the debate, um, first, um, uh, Arancha said a little bit differently what I said about the interconnected question 
Of course, all the questions are directly connected uh, and it's impossible to, to cut trait uh, of all the other consideration about uh, 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 environment, environment uh, climate, uh, migration, etc. Et why is it like that in the trade system? Uh, why do we have to maybe to include in bilateral agreement environment and social or other consideration? It's because it's difficult to have agreement on that in other places. It's why probably the bilateral agreement could become really uh, a way to do different things as uh, trade, but uh, developing a human rights condition, environmental condition. It's normal, it's like that. It's also because of crisis on global uh, discussion on, on, on global level is so difficult on all the other issues, human rights, etc., etc. Second thing, uh, the, the critical mass uh, for the topics uh, which some agreement could take place. Who decides uh, the topic? Of course, uh, the, it's a critical mass, uh, yes, the economic weight or the number of countries. But it means that automatically uh, other countries or other topics are not, of course, taking, uh, in, uh, taking into account or are left behind. And it's why this system, of course, organizes the repetition uh, automatically of order or exclusion or feeling of exclusion uh, because who, who determines the topic where an agreement could take place? Uh, it's only the people around the table. And those one we are, we, who are not in, uh, around the table, maybe who, who decide that? So it's really a system very vicious because uh, we don't know who decides the topic, who decides which is the, ki the kind of critical mass, only economic weight, steel, uh, I don't know which products or, or fisheries, that's multilateral, we agreed on that, but on other issues, who decided that? Where was it decided? So what about transparency? It's maybe not the, the best, uh, the best uh, uh, system. And what about uh, the system? For example, how do we protect the non-participant in an agreement? How do we inform where we are? Could they, could they become observer in the process, as it is the case for the settlement dispute? It's important because it's also a way to prepare or to train uh, some countries not in capacity to do something to be prepared uh, in this uh, kind of process. So there are many questions and conditions in order to accept or to develop this kind of approach uh, uh, regarding the, 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 the plurilateral or multilateral approach. And I, I, I finished it with that. I think that trade is not an island in the world. It's the consequence of, all, of many other disagreements on the global level. And it's why uh, uh, we try to solve problems through trade, but Jungtat is... Uh, the mandate of Jungtat is trade for development, so of course, our point of view is especially how trade helps to development. That's our goal, That's, we, are, we, are, we are there to do that differently, uh, probably a little bit differently as the other. And on that issue, I think that uh, uh, in this perspective, plurilateral approach is really left some countries or some population behind. So on the question, what else should the WTO be doing, it's, I guess it's a little shocking uh, that I should be the panelist to raise this point. But uh, <laughs> uh, of course, we should, we should keep plugging away at multilateralism where multilateral solutions are obviously required. So we need to keep working at the fishery subsidies negotiation multilaterally. We need to keep working at the difficult agriculture questions multilaterally. Uh, that seems to be one, one obvious answer. Um, second point, um, we have in the WTO a beautiful system of uh, committees, regular committees that oversee the implementation of our existing agreements. And that system is vastly underutilized. Even our general counsel is vastly underutilized. These, these committees are, are, are performing well below their potential to be forums where we can, we can make progress on transparency, where we can, we can have uh, discussions about issues like differentiation, and where we can, we, can, we can begin to learn about issues that aren't very well understood yet. So we're completely underutilizing uh, our regular committees, and that's, it requires a lot of work on the part of members uh, to, to, to bring uh, the ideas and the energy into those committees. We get so focused on negotiations 
that we lose sight of the, the immense importance of, of, of that system of committees. So that's, that's a second point. One other quick point I'd, I'd raise, which is not directly answering the question, but responding to some earlier comments. We've heard through this discussion the question raised, how do we protect non-participants in, in these plurilateral processes? And this really puzzles me. Pro protect from what? Uh, we, you know, the, the participants in the e-commerce joint statement I don't believe uh, are asking the question, how can we work together to make things more difficult for non-participants in that process? The discussion is, what sort of potential rules could we look at that expand the space for e-commerce and digital trade? Uh, this almost certainly will have to be applied on a most favored nation basis, trying to slice and dice the application of rules short of an MFN basis makes everyone heads hurt. So, so what, what, what are we protecting non-participants from? I'm, I'm genuinely confused. Uh, Patrick, uh, to your questions, I'm thinking the rationale behind the reluctance of uh, developing countries on new issues. A lot, uh, Ambassador Benning just mentioned the special and differential treatment. Why special and differential treatment is so important for developing countries? According to my understanding, SND is the therapy, not the cause. What's the cause? The cause is the lack of capacity in the international rulemaking. And I think this is the typical demonstration of a development divide. And this lack of uh, capacity can be seen in different aspects. The capacity to analyze the scenario outcome of the new rules and the capacity to participate and bargain in the negotiation and the capacity to implement the agreement and benefit from the outcome of the agreement. So, of course, uh, technical assistance is important uh, in this regard. We appreciate very much the excellent work has been done by Acton, ANTAD, and ITC. But I don't think developing countries can rely solely on the technical assistance because the, the capacity to participate in international, international rulemaking is a reflection of the country's comprehensive strength. It's also related to the domestic policy orientation. The extent of developing country can benefit from the international new agreement largely depends on whether it has implemented the policy which is compatible to the agreement or establishment of new mechanism. So it's a quite a complicated issue. I don't think there's a simple answer to it. Yeah. Well, I think we should probably move to a Q&A so we get a chance. Um, to, to get some um, input from, from the very large audience here. I just want to make one observation or suggestion to what Chris, Chris's point. Maybe what they're being protected from, one way of thinking of it is the difference between de jure and de facto discrimination. There's no de jure discrimination at stake here. The de facto discrimination potentially could arise from the incapacity for meaningful participation. And so, at the end of the day, the country that has that challenge is the primary responsible one, but there's lots and lots that can be done to help that process. I think that would be the, the answer to that. But again, I'm not a panelist. Okay, so <laughs> if, if, you, um, if you could say who you are, um, and you can direct your question to any of the panelists if that's your preference. I see one at the back. Chuan from the International Trade Center. <laughs> um, <laughs> Indeed. Well, it's not really directed to my boss there, but uh, that was a wise. That's panel. a wise decision. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I think one of the questions uh, I have about uh, the critical uh, mass plurilateral is that it seems that we work on the assumption that uh, if we extend the benefits to the ones that are not participating in it they all be happily uh, accept the benefits and, uh, and allow the members that are in it, in, in, in the plurilateral to put it in the, in the WTO system. Uh, it worked fine for the ITA because it clearly conveys the benefit, cutting tariffs, 
But for the new topics such as e-commerce and, for example, investment facilitation, this plurilaterals is rather a process of setting international standards, as, as Aaron mentioned, and also harmonizing uh, regulations. There's not really a clear um, convey of benefits for the ones that are not participating in it. So in that scenario, how uh, can the members in the plurilateral um, convey uh, or, or convince the, the, the non-members that uh, this is working, uh, putting uh, the plurilateral in, in the system is working towards their interest? Thank you. Who, who you want to answer? <laughs> well, the panel. <laughs> or you, if you. I'm not a panelist, sorry. Okay, any, any volunteers? Maybe just one comment. It's true that it's a, a problem of regulation in many different fields. So is it possible to try to have with a critical mass, I don't know with how many uh, members, but um, with a critical mass to go to some global standards, maybe not for all, because it's a plurilateral approach, but very large uh, support for global standards, or is it better to let many bilateral agreements organizing uh, specific standards in different regions of the world. So that's the difference. And if it's possible to uh, put on the table some, some global standards, uh, it's maybe uh, the, the best way to try to convince other partners to take uh, place and to, to come on board. The reason why it's maybe useful to have an open uh, uh, solution, so to be uh, transparent and to be open to all the different participants, but the way of the organization of the regulation, regulatory process is to be sure that it's possible to make some progresses. Also, if there are some member states against the evolution in some fields. And so the critical mass in my mind for some issues is maybe not so far than all the member states but with maybe some exceptions if there are people without any willingness to move. Of course, if we are doing that, I'm not, I'm not have an, an example in my mind, but we need to uh, avoid any discrimination for the non-participating countries. And on that, it's true that we need to, uh, to have a real discussion and to see what are the possibilities to do that, maybe with a real role for the uh, uh, WTO on that, maybe with a real role for the Secretary General. Uh, Isabel, you wanted to say I, I will only uh, uh, another remark. But if we, we are doing like that, uh, a global agreement or a global standard, the global standard will become the rule. Uh, it, will be, it, it will become the rule for everybody for a more or less long period. It depends on the capacity of the order outside of the agreement to change it after. Uh, but in any case, it's a way to impose to the non-participant an agreement, uh, a global agreement, uh, maybe not compatible with those uh, uh, other countries or member. So I, I, I have no my miraculous solution eh? because of course we have to work. But in any case, even this global agreement on issues could be also a danger uh, for the, the country outside, except the fact if there is only one or two outside. In this case, well, it's not a global agreement, it's more or less a, a unanimous uh, uh, standard. And in this case, we are not far from, from the the, the, the multilateral approach. So uh, I think that, well, it's really difficult. And the topic, the question of the topic and the critical mass, who choose the, the, the topic and which is the level of the critical mass is really the question. And it's why I think that, for example, on e-commerce or investment facilitation, what we need, it's maybe not to have so, so, so uh, quickly a, a big agreement. It's really to work with all the people in order to uh, make converge the different level of the countries on those issues, on e-commerce, on uh, investment facilitation, helping to elevate the global level of all the countries in order to uh, be able, at the end, to have a global agreement. Mark, you wanted to say something? Yeah. With regard to this, this concern, which, which obviously is, is, is legitimate, I think the, the only way forward is inclusiveness. Everyone can come to those discussions. Everyone can come. Um, a big role of the Secretariat, such that there is full information sharing. Um, and uh, members can always join whatever the outcome is at a later stage when they are ready. Um, it is true, of course, and we have been saying this a number of times, that 
multilateral is first best. But we also have to recognize that, for instance, with regard to e-commerce, we are now celebrating the 20th anniversary of discussions in the WTO. So after a while, uh, you've got to ask yourself the question, uh, shouldn't we start looking for something else? Without being uh, discriminatory vis-a-vis -vis anyone, um, and if there are problems for non-participants, then uh, let them voice their concerns in an explicit manner. But I don't think it is uh, very useful to talk about this in general terms. Let us, let us, let us do that yeah. on the basis of specific issues as they come up. Yeah, but, that's in the e-commerce the, the e link. Huh? Yeah, it is. It's already there, yeah. Bernard. Yeah, just on this on this question, I think there there is a mindset problem here, and it's kind of implicit or explicit in the question, which is that this is all about rules. This is all about hard law. This is all about being taking people to court. I think a lot of the issues that are likely to be discussed in these types of arrangements are, as I've mentioned before, they're going to be about what kind of domestic policy in this area actually makes sense. Now. Every government in the world regulates. And I think what this process can potentially do is actually to get people to deliberate, like Arantxa was saying, on what actually makes sense to do. And then they do it, or they don't do it, right? But they're going to do it in any event. So I think this issue of what happens, and, and to worry, a bit, I guess this also goes to Chris's point, what, what is the downside for the countries that don't participate? For In a lot of those areas, it's simply not going to be there. right? So I think these are issues that really do come up if we're talking about binding rules in terms of how thou shalt do something. But that's really, I don't think we're going to get a lot of that out of these types of processes. And that's really what the subsidy arena is about. That's what these other issues are about. Because there it's really about thou shalt not do something. This is much more about this is how we shall proceed to do it. Right? And so in that sense, I think it's a different, different world. Thank you. Let's have some more questions. There's one. My name is Abit Khan from Bangladesh Mission. I have two questions. Uh, one is specific to actually uh, proletariat e-commerce. Uh, I have a question to the Ambassador Mark, the Ambassador of European Union. So you are saying that it, it should be inclusive, so you want uh, the inclusiveness in the discussion. So inclusiveness, not in terms of presence. The inclusiveness, we need to have in participation in trade. Let us look at you know, the, what is uh, actually current status in e-commerce. This out of you know this, they are saying that 22 trillion trade is only 5 percent is cross-border e-commerce, and in that maybe you know that only 10 countries are participating in cross-border e-commerce. How can you make the rules inclusive when you know that many countries are not participating in cross-border e-commerce, and or little participation in uh, cross-border e-commerce, and they have limited knowledge. And how you're making a rule with the participation of some of the developing countries who does not have any idea of cross-border e-commerce, how it happens. So how can we make inclusive in terms of negotiation, in terms of trade? That is my first question. The second question is that the proletariat, the new way towards global trade. You see, you mentioned about the Tokyo round, that we had uh, many uh, proletariats. But you know that in Tokyo round, there are no such rules on plurilaterals. But if, you, if we go through this, you know, the WTO agreement, how plurilaterals will actually come into force, it mentioned that, you know, if you want to amend the Annex 4, there must be a consensus by the WTO members. So how could we handle that one when you negotiate plurilaterals and be part of the WTO agreement? Thank you. Uh, uh, did I hear your name, Mark, mentioned by the speaker? <laughs> I can do the first question. I'm not certain I understood the second, but it has to do with the acoustics, I think. I mean, I, uh, so if perhaps, Patrick, you, you can... No, I think the first bit was how can you possibly be expected to participate at all if you know nothing, was basically... No, I mean, and that's a very... Look, you know, it, it's, it's an, a question that has been raised already a number yeah. of times. That is of technical capacity. Yeah. And technical capacity has to be uh, uh, looked into. Um, clearly... Information sharing by the WTO Secretariat 
uh, inclusiveness are answers. Um, if people have specific problems, say on e-commerce, let them come up with it. Let them uh, say what their specific problem is with regard to a specific issue. If you have a problem with, say, electronic signature or spam or uh, electronic payments, well, let us then have the specific discussion on this. What, what is it that your uh, system does not allow you to cater for? Uh, I believe we have to do this on a, on a very down-to-earth, case-by-case uh, 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 way. Uh, if there are uh, really substantial problems, let, let us discuss them. I mean, the, in addition, what should also be um, mentioned and what hasn't been mentioned yet today is there is this plurilateral track, but there is also the multilateral track continuing in the WTO on e-commerce. So we will be able to raise all these sorts of issues in the multilateral contexts, context as well. If I understand the second question, it was essentially about how these things would get adopted at the end in the, in the WTO framework. That would be by consensus. But so, I mean, whatever is agreed in one of these critical mass type agreements, if we're assuming that's the way it's going to go, will have to be signed on to as covered by the WTO by the membership. And consensus isn't unanimity, I learned this afternoon. Um, Okay, can we have a couple more questions? Yes. Tom Miles from Reuters <coughs> News Agency. Um, it's my understanding that the, the US uh, pretty much pulled the plug on the sort of multilateral um, track at, at uh, Buenos Aires. And um, the surprising, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm going wrong, but, but my understanding was that it was the US who said, you know, we no longer want to have the multilateral trading system at the at the heart of our uh, declaration at the end of the uh, conference. And it seems now that the other members of the organization are to some extent sort of, you know, dancing to US tune, which is to have, let's have these small uh, plurilaterals. But what, would anybody ever consider a plurilateral of 163 members and just leave the US to one side if, if they don't want to participate? Um, Tom, and secondly, Tom yes, uh, you, who do you want to ask that question um, to? Well, <laughs> maybe, maybe Ambassador Van Hoytland, but I, but I have one for, I have one for Chris Wilson as well, which is just if you could elaborate a little further on, you know, what else would you not veto at the multilateral level, apart from, uh, you said, fish, uh, subsidies, um, agriculture. What else, what criteria do you think, um, you know, you need to see to, to agree to have something at the multilateral level? Thank you. There, there has been a misunderstanding here. Uh, uh, we were actively participating in Buenos Aires with the Argentine minister uh, to develop a declaration that in fact would have uh, acknowledged the importance of the multilateral trading system. Uh, and that didn't work. <laughs> okay. Look, I don't think we're, we're looking into a crystal ball and projecting the, the, the future of all issues that potentially can be brought into negotiations in the WTO on a, on a multilateral level. We have a, a couple of uh, uh, very current issues that are the subject of broad attention on the part of a lot of members, that I, the two that I mentioned, agricultural and fishery subsidies, which again, from our perspective, and I think all of the panelists here, can only... Uh, uh, have meaningful solutions through through multilateral negotiations. The fact that I've mentioned those two, I don't think should be interpreted as, as excluding all other issues from future multilateral negotiations in the WTO. But just maybe on that to say that if we have an agreement at the multilateral level, to take an example, climate change, the Paris Agreement, and then we have one member state going out you are staying with an agreement with all the, the other participants. So it's not so different. And uh, so I said it's maybe possible to have sometimes a plurilateral uh, agreement with a critical mass. If I'm looking at the situation about climate change, sometimes after the Paris Agreement, we are not so far than that. 
we are with an agreement, but maybe with uh, the willingness of one participant to go out. We are staying for the others with the same agreement. I think we have time for one more. Hi, my name is Mario Jalis, and I'm from the Commodities Branch at UNCTAD. Um, my question goes back to revisit the idea of development. So when the Doha round started, it was the development round. And at the core of development is agriculture. It's historically seen as that the agriculture sector was left behind in a way compared to other sectors of the economy and that most developing countries that depend on agriculture were not able to extract the same sort of concessions that other sectors had already achieved. So we fast forward almost two decades and one of the goals back in the Doha Declaration was to achieve substantial, develop, uh, substantial reductions in domestic support in agriculture. So today, most developing countries are still mostly rural. Most people depend on agriculture. They're resource poor farmers. So my question to the delegates, mostly from the developed countries, is by embarking on plurilateral negotiations, do we get closer to convincing developed countries to make commitments to substantially reduce domestic support in agriculture? Do we get closer to that goal? Do we remain at a neutral uh, point or do we get further away? Because in a way we could argue that we are creating, we are already giving um, some interest groups, mostly in developed countries that see that they can gain a lot from trade facilitation or e-commerce. I'm not saying that developing countries cannot gain, they can also gain. But mostly we have very powerful interest groups pushing for these goals um, in these plurilateral negotiations. So by achieving some of the goals that these very powerful interest groups have, don't we, can't we argue that the goals of achieving development through the substantial reductions in domestic support and agriculture in a way get harder to achieve? This is what I, I think that by you know, going away from the single undertaking, we make it even harder to achieve anything in agriculture. We haven't achieved we have achieved very little in the, almost last, in the almost 20 years that have gone by since the um, Doha Declaration. So to summarize my question, do the plurilaterals make it easier, harder, or make no difference in terms of achieving development through agriculture, which is uh, a sector that could indeed really change development prospects for developing countries? Thank you. Um, I think the one does not exclude the other. Um, before Buenos Aires, uh, the European Union, together with Brazil, Uruguay, Peru, Colombia, made a proposal on cutting subsidies in uh, agriculture. Um, if people are prepared to resume the discussion on agricultural subsidies tomorrow, we'll be there. No problem at all. But the one does not exclude the other. In, if we're not making progress on agricultural subsidies, that should therefore not imply that we cannot talk about anything else. Um, on e-commerce, on investment facilitation, on a number of other topics, there is a large number of countries willing to move forward and let us then also try and use the momentum that is there. But agricultural subsidies, market access, be it on agriculture, be it in industry, let us uh, bring it back. I mean, we are, uh, we are open for business. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we need to make a, a distinction between the original Tokyo around uh, uh, proletary agreement, like a civil uh, agreement, and uh, the current uh, like mandate uh, members' discussion on new issues. Uh, they are different. Uh, and uh, those new issues like e-commerce, investment facilitation, are directly linked with the development for developing countries. For example, there are thousands of uh, meat smiths in developing countries that need to take advantage of the platform of e-commerce. But e-commerce relies on the infrastructure, which is related to investment facilitation. And the discussion of investment facilitation was initiated by a group of developing countries. Of course, agriculture is important for developing countries. But we need to recognize life is not waiting for us. Business, economic development, technology development, 
is not waiting for us. So we, we need to continue to push the negotiations in WTO on the agriculture issue. At the same time, we also need to look at the new issues to participate the like-minded uh, members' discussions. Yeah. Thank you, really. Uh, I followed the question uh, submitted by our good friend from Antad. Uh, he's right. Uh, we should balance uh, uh, the work and the result. Uh, we should uh, uh, have results in agriculture, including cotton, because uh, Chris didn't mention cotton, and also uh, special and differentiated treatment. And I would like to have the comments and perspectives of Chris on SND issues, because this gathering is very important. We have uh, different stakeholders in the, in the room. And finally, on uh, new issues, we do not oppose them blankly. Uh, we know that uh, they have potential. For instance, on e-commerce, uh, even in the least developed countries, uh, innovators are developing uh, platforms for export of goods and services. And we have instruments like in PESA, in Kenya. Uh, in the western uh, region of Africa, we have a world limit uh, and other instruments. Uh, what we are requesting is to have infrastructure to bridge the gap of the uh, digital divide and to use uh, the contribution of our partners, bilateral, regional, and we have EU with us and other regional partners. Uh, and it's, we are very happy to have uh, uh, the Vice President, uh, the Vice Prime Minister of uh, the Kingdom of Belgium with us this afternoon. Uh, political uh, policy makers uh, are very important in promoting this effort and uh, dialogue. Uh, I thank you. Uh, Chris, do you want to take up the cudgels? Well, just. Just briefly to, to respond to Ambassador Lauru, I, I think, I mean, this is an incredibly difficult issue we've been confronting now for, for a number of years. And I, I think the difficulty is, is, is not one of acceptance or rejection of the concept of special and differential treatment. The, the difficulty is that we've, we've cornered ourselves into a situation in which the issue of special and differential treatment is now being pr painted with an exceptionally broad brush so that we, we can only talk about um, new exceptions from existing rules if those exceptions are applied in equal measure to all developing country members of the WTO. And that simply makes no sense. It gets back to the discussion that we, we've had throughout the course of the afternoon on, on uh, differentiation. We have been completely unsuccessful uh, in the negotiations in the WTO in being able to draw those distinctions in a way that is any way, in any way workable. Uh, and again, this is, this is not a discussion about least developed country members. The, the difficulty lies beyond the scope of, of that subset of members. I, I think we should probably um, stop there because time has run out almost. And I'd like, first of all, to invite you to thank the panel very much indeed for an interesting set of... <laughs> and, uh, and now to invite the Director General to go to the podium to make his address. So, good afternoon, uh, everybody, uh, panelists, uh, colleagues, audience. Uh, very pleased to be here again at the Graduate uh, Institute uh, to join a very important conversation, I think, about the way forward uh, in global trade. And at the outset, let me thank uh, Minister uh, uh, Reinders of, uh, of the uh, Belgian government and the center uh, uh, for trade and economic integration for this initiative. And I hear, of course, that you have had uh, a very interesting conversation. I heard uh, a little bit of it, um, and I was excited trying to jump in, but I'm 
holding back. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to have a, a chance, therefore, to share uh, some thoughts with you, uh, even though I may be repeating uh, some of the things you already heard. So um, I apologize for that. Um, and in, in, in offering my thoughts, I would recall that the title of the event uh, asks us uh, to start at Buenos Aires. Uh, so I will do precisely that. So what happened uh, at MC11? So there was uh, uh, some uh, progress, I would say, in, in areas, in some areas, but it's clear that we did not have any substantive uh, outcomes. Uh, and there are uh, many reasons uh, for that. Let's not be simplistic about this um, and finger pointing this or that. It was much more complex than a simple uh, explanation. Um, and there were, I think, uh, few uh, potential trade-offs, I think, that would force flexibility. That was also a reality uh, in Buenos Aires. And flexibility um, is essential. Uh, in the process of consensus-based decision-making, which is the one that we follow at the WTO. So this system of consensus um, has some very interesting dynamics uh, built into it and a culture somewhat built into the negotiating uh, exercise as well. Uh, and a very common uh, calculation in a negotiator that is in a consensus-based uh, system is the following. If I block progress in the other areas, the other guys are going to agree to what I'm asking for. That's a very common uh, cultural uh, calculation in the minds of the negotiator. And I say that because I was one. All right, So I know that this is in the back of the minds of several of the negotiators, if not all of them. Now, of course, this rationale doesn't always work. So there are obvious situations. The first one is um, there may not be a strong push to get outcomes in the other areas. So essentially, there is no hostage to be taken uh, because there is nothing to exchange for. But that is one, one common reason. The second one is that what you're asking for may be too expensive for everybody else. So no matter what is happening in the other areas, if you're asking for too much, uh, the others are going to you know, make their calculations and say, well, what I'm giving here is not compensated by what I would be getting elsewhere. So that also frustrates the, the, this, this kind of calculation of I block somewhere else, I get what I want. And if we did really, honestly, uh, make a calculation about the trade-offs that we had at the table before Buenos Aires, what happened in Buenos Aires was not a surprise, I have to tell you. Now, under any circumstances, and the circumstances vary, but under any circumstances, uh, the problem with this approach is that this approach does not encourage flexibility. And it does not encourage a search for a compromise, a search for common ground. Instead, it tends to encourage an, an all or nothing, mutually agreed, this, uh, mutually assured destruction kind of operation or mode. Now, so this is one problem we have with this. Uh, this a similar uh, phenomenon, uh, also in this consensus-based system, is the zero-risk approach. What is the zero-risk approach? And I'm inventing these things, so I, I don't know that, I, that you will understand what I'm trying to get at, but that, I hope that my explanation will, will, will clarify that. So for example, you, you look at an initiative that you don't like. You say, well, this is a risky proposition for me. Now, in a consensus-based approach, depending on how you play your cards, you can effectively stop this initiative even from being discussed. It's not from being agreed. You can stop from at, at the very beginning of the conversation. Now, and this, and this is problematic because pretty much every single initiative will not be uh, liked by everybody. There, there, it is very likely that all issues are going to meet some opposition from someone. 
So for a consensus-based system to really work, all participants must realize that the indiscriminate usage of the power to block will paralyze the system and eventually destroy it. Now, so what is the way forward in a consensus-based system? I think at first, you really do have to value the system. You really do. It's not just politics and you know, rhetoric. You really do have to value the system and treat it as a common good. Now, the second point is that you have to be ready to compromise. You have to be ready to seek common ground from day one. Now, I said at the closing, my closing statement in Buenos Aires, that if members are not prepared to put themselves in other shoes and to seek compromises, then we have little hope of moving forward. I also said that the pledges of support for the system needed to be matched by words, by, by deeds, not only words. And I recently had a meeting uh, with the uh, ACP group in the WTO, Ambassador LaRue was there, uh, and I was asked the question about how I see our work progressing and evolving. And I think this is the key question uh, that we have uh, before us today. Uh, and this is also the question that is being asked here at this seminar. Um, and I emphasize at that point in time that the organization has changed significantly over the last two decades. Uh, today, um, the bigger members, no matter how powerful they are, um, and I, th I think this was said already today, but I will repeat it, uh, they cannot uh, impose uh, or force their views uh, and the agenda on others. Uh, but, but equally, uh, groups of members, no matter how numerous they are, they cannot impose their views either on the others. So in this, I would say, new normal, uh, we have to be more flexible. I think no one uh, should be forced uh, to accept anything or to negotiate anything that you don't want to negotiate. But at the same time, um, anyone should be free to discuss whatever it is that they want to discuss uh, and that is of interest to them. And I also th think that this was said this before today. So where, where are we now? And I would go to the point of flexibility. Flexibility has always been a feature of the multilateral trading system. Uh, the GET rules already had inbuilt flexibilities uh, in different forms. Uh, and the same applies for the WTO rules. Uh, and, you know, people often see the WTO disciplines as a as monolith or as a rigid, one-size-fits-all uh, set of rules. But this is far from true, far from true. Uh, while uh, the core uh, rules of the WTO apply uh, to everyone, the specific obligations vary considerably across the membership. Uh, one example. Uh, members have different levels of commitments in goods. Uh, some have bound 100% of their tariffs, some very low, other higher. Um, some have less than half of their tariffs uh, limited by a ceiling with any kind of commitment. Some have great sectoral coverage uh, in their services commitments. Others have just a few uh, sectors covering their commitments. And in terms of Specific agreements, uh, again, flexibility is a key feature. So we have flexibility in geometry. Um, for example, the plurilateral initiatives, like uh, the government procurement agreement, which applies only to the signatories. Or you have the uh, information technology agreement, which is uh, on an FM MFN basis. Um, and you have flexibility in substance. And the trade facilitation agreement is a good example of that where uh, each developing country, not all as a best, each one of them may ask for technical assistance and may decide how fast they can implement uh, each specific commitment. Each one, each provision. They will say, this one, I need so much time. That one, I need so much time. And by the way, I need technical assistance on this one or that one. We also have flexibility on how to discuss uh, and when to discuss issues. Now. Different ways of bringing things to the table uh, have always existed. There have been uh, some members uh, willing to advance conversations uh, and take on more obligations than others. Um, and I think it has already been mentioned here, the, the example of the Tokyo Round in the 70s uh, and the, uh, 
the codes that emerged uh, from that. That was one way of doing it. Uh, because uh, those issues were not accepted by the full GET uh, membership, um, <clears throat> they were often informally called codes. Uh, and they included areas such as subsidies and countervailing measures, technical barriers to trade, uh, the standards code, uh, anti-dumping, import licensing, safeguards, and many others. Now, the codes were not multilateral, but they were a beginning. Uh, and they helped to plant the seeds for the WTO multilateral agreements. Now, one may say, uh, well, they were imposed on anybody else. Well, I can say from my perspective, they were not imposed on me. They were not imposed on, on my country. That was part of a negotiation, and we got things in exchange for that. So the, 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 the fact that some things that are controversial at the end of the day were acceptable is because there were trade-offs that allowed that to be acceptable. Now, little by little, the larger developing countries started to adhere to the codes, the membership started to grow, the codes got into the Uruguay round, they turned into multilateral commitments, and it was not, by the way, a cut and paste transplantation. Um, they were adapted. So the codes inspired and provided the basis for the Uruguay round text. Now, this is just one illustration of how issues, often controversial, may be brought to the table with flexible approaches. Now, this brings to the initiatives that we saw in Buenos Aires, uh, which may uh, be testing yet other forms of flexibility. Now, the open-ended groups that were created in MC11 are, I think, a somewhat uh, new approach. And I agree with the ambassador of China who just made that point a moment ago. Um, and I think that they responded to the risk of paralysis uh, that would come from the objection to have any conversation about anything uh, until the Doha work program was concluded. That was, I understand, the motivation uh, for those uh, uh, initiatives. Now, it is, I think, interesting to look at the makeup of those groups, and they include um, uh, developing countries, least developed countries, uh, developed countries. It's not a strict north-south divide. And, and, and I think, unlike uh, some situations in the past, the major proponents in some of those groups were developing countries, almost exclusively, by the way, developing countries. So it is a new way of doing things. It's a different, at least it's a different way uh, of doing things. Now, I'm not going to say how many and uh, what the percentage of global trade each one of those groups uh, had. I think you probably have that information already. I just want to stress that this, these groups are at a very early stage. We don't know how they are going to evolve. Um, um, I think that what is important to understand, as far as I am concerned, is that what the proponents are saying is by simply sitting down to, to have a conversation, it doesn't mean that you're committing to anything. You're not committing, certainly, to negotiate. You're not committing to any kind of outcome. You're simply sitting down to have a conversation. Um, and time will tell how those initiatives are going to evolve. Uh, what I think is essential is that these groups remain open to everyone. Um, and I understand that the proponents of the initiatives, they want to see at the end of the day, hopefully, in their view, uh, a multilateral outcome, which I think is very, very, very welcome. Now, to achieve that kind of outcome, I think the groups will need uh, to build uh, that perspective from the very start. So they need to afford any and all WTO members the opportunity to participate actively and constructively from day one. Uh, and any discussions in those groups should already uh, be taking into account the perspectives of the others, even those who are not in the group. Now, we have to see how this work evolves. As I have stressed repeatedly, this will be up to the proponents on how they want to, to make it happen. It is for them to take these initiatives forward as they see fit. Um, but we have to ask, why did the members decide uh, to create these groups? And I think there are alternatives uh, when somebody wants to uh, advance an issue. Um, essentially, there are two options today. One is you do it outside the WTO. The other one is you do it inside the WTO. And inside the WTO, either with everybody, 
or with those who are willing to have a conversation. Now, if we drive these conversations away from the WTO, and that has been my point throughout, the danger is that they will not be open to everyone. Now, they will most likely, and I would bet my savings, that they will come back to the WTO. They are not going to stay outside. They are going to come back. And when they do, you would not have made your contribution in shaping those uh, initiatives. So my preference would always be to have these initiatives, whatever they are, in the WTO, and that they are open, that they are transparent, where anyone and everyone has a chance to shape the conversations, if they so desire. If they don't want to participate, that's fine too. But I think that kind of flexibility has to be there. So we have to keep this work in perspective. Uh, at this stage, uh, the initiatives that I mentioned are simply conversations among like-minded members on issues that they find economically and even politically important. And let me be clear again that simply having these discussions, uh, it does not mean abandoning uh, issues that are already on the table. This is very important. Because people are talking about these issues, I don't think that they would like to abandon the issues that are already on the table. And these include issues that are very dear to WTO members, both developed and developing, particularly develop, developing countries, such as domestic support in agriculture that has been mentioned here, uh, food security, development, and others. Um, members, including proponents in these uh, open-ended groups, they are not giving up these discussions. I don't think so. That's what I hear from them. They want these discussions on all those issues to go on. In Buenos Aires, in my meetings uh, with everybody, with ministers, before, during, and after Buenos Aires, uh, there was a clear desire to keep up these debates and to find ways forward. Now, in fact, um, and that was a point that was made, I think, earlier uh, just now, uh, one could argue that by putting more things on the table, adding some more elements into the mix, uh, might help precisely uh, to achieve progress uh, where uh, progress has eluded us for so long. Now, this brings me back um, to, my, uh, to the question that was posed at today's uh, event, specifically, are plurilaterals the new way forward in global trade? Um, and in my view, the future is not uh, plurilaterals. The future is flexibility. Now, plurilateral initiatives may be part of that, um, but I have set out uh, that there are different ways of delivering flexibility within multilateral approaches as well. Uh, the trade facilitation agreement is obviously uh, a clear example of that. Now, flexibility will not lead to fragmentation. In fact, um, a, in a system with 164 members of different sizes, different priorities, and different stages of development, flexibility is precisely the way to avoid fragmentation. Now, the success of the trade facilitation agreement has been and remains a great galvanizing, uh, uh, uniting force for WTO members. It showed that flexibility and the search for common ground can deliver uh, benefits for everyone. Uh, the TFA structure is certainly not a panacea. Let's be clear about that. Um, it will not work every time, and it will not work in every circumstance. Uh, but it shows that solutions can be found if we're truly committed to multilateralism. So I urge every member, everybody, to consider how we can uh, creatively improve the functioning of the WTO. Uh, we must ensure that it is as responsive uh, to members' interests as possible, and that working together, uh, we can deliver uh, the positive results that we all see. And as you have probably figured, uh, this is the end of my intervention. So thank you all. I saw a gesture from Jost saying that there were drinks to be had. 
So I think with that, we should just move along. Thank you. Thank you very much.